know about you, but I believe the Lord spoke to us this morning, and I believe that God again wants to speak to us again this evening. I'm not, I'm not going to preach out of these verses of Scripture that I'm going to read to you, but as I thought more and more about the Scriptures that, um, and the, the message that uh, uh, I wanted to share with you tonight, along the same lines of overcoming fear, um, I thought to myself, you know, people throughout the Bible are just like you and I. I mean, no doubt in my mind, when a guy, I don't care how big and how tough he is, and some of you guys that's trained in the military, when you go out into the battlefield, it's a scary place. Um, you know, from places and people that I've talked to that's, you know, even policemen, I mean, they go out into the battle every day and, and possibly get shot at and stuff. It's got, it's got to be a, a fearful thing. But I remember reading in the Word of the Lord in several different places. I'm not going to preach out of this. I'm only going to mention it and move on. Is where that uh, when Joshua was going out to to fight into the land of Canaan, they, they, they came up against many adversaries along the journey. In several places throughout the first chapter of Joshua, the Lord over and over again told Joshua these words. said, Be strong and be of good courage. For, for, for thou, let me go back to verse 6. He says, Be strong and be of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance. He tells them in verse number 3 that every place that the sole of their foot lands, you shall conquer. Verse 7 says, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to the law. Verse 9 says, have, I, have not I commanded thee? Be strong and be of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And again, the scene that God is telling us in the Word that He's going to be with us. These scriptures that I read out of Psalms this evening, that God is going to be with us as we call upon His name. Amen? Turn with me back into Matthew chapter 6. For the benefit of those that were not here this morning, we preached the first part of this message today on overcoming fear. There's only a portion of the scripture that I want to read to you this evening. And I want to just read this kind of, or it won't take as much time to get started here. But it says there in verse number 30 of Matthew, excuse me, Matthew number 6. He says, Wherefore, if God, so clothe the grass of the field, which is today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven. Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? 31 says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall, or whether all shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knoweth what, or knoweth that you have need of all of these things. Verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Again in verse number 34. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for morrow or tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil. Thereof. In other words, that latter part is simply telling you that you're going to have to deal with it again tomorrow. And you're going to have to deal with it again the next day. And you're going to have to deal with it the next day. But what he's really trying to tell us here in these scriptures is, is to put your faith in God and trust the Lord. I want to pray. Before we get started this evening, I want you to pray for me that God would help us this evening. Father, in Jesus' name, we love you, we praise you, we thank you, Heavenly Father. God, for this time that you've given us this evening. Father, I pray, God, that you touch us, help us, oh God, this evening, to give us wisdom as we open up the word of the Lord this evening. Hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Let Jesus Christ be seen in him only in this place tonight. That, Father, as everything that's said and everything that's done, God, is going to give you praise, you glory, and you honor. So, Father, we ask you this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We left off this morning with a scripture before we went into the be confident of the Lord. 
And in the scripture, we talked about how the Bible teaches us in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 7. For the Bible teaches us as we look at the word of the Lord, the Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. How do we overcome fear? We talked about the first thing this morning as we, we brought, it, brought out the word confidence. Is that we have confidence in God. Confidence, my friend, creates faith, not fear. Say that with me. Confidence creates faith, not fear. Confidence is, as we see in the word of the Lord, or the, the word confidence is a feeling of trust in a person or a thing. It's reliance. It's faith. It's relational as trustworthy, intimacy, self-assurance, and fearlessness. And we see here this, this, morning, this afternoon, we kind of concluded this morning in, on this. Paul the Apostle had faith. But I still know that Paul dealt with, dealt with faith. Paul dealt with things that that Paul prayed about it. He asked God to, to do things for him. And he asked him to remove that thorn that he dealt with every day. But the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for thee. So we know that Paul the apostle dealt with things that, that really is not even described, even though there was much of Paul's life that was described. But Paul says in, in, in Romans 8, leading down through that, he said in all of these things we are more than Conquerors. And then the next thing we, we threw out there this morning real quickly was that we know him through our life experiences. As you journey through life, as you go from, from glory to glory, if you go from one situation to the next situation, as God brings you through a situation, you're going to know without a shadow of a doubt he'll do it again. If God brought me through this, I know that he'll bring me through the next thing I face. And then we thought about how the, the Bible teaches us in this scripture of how that he, and the, the scripture that we read to you is how that Jesus was really trying to teach them to uh, be confident in God, even the fowl of the air, even the birds. Uh, and I was reading commentary and it talked about how that even the birds, they don't worry, they don't fret. What the birds do, they, they live. God supplies their daily bread, if you will. They just get up the next morning. They just go back out on the earth and they'll scratch and look for bugs and look for insects and look for things that they eat. God takes care of them. And the Lord has given you and I that same promise that God is going to take care of you. God is going to take care of me. And God promised us that through His Word. So we look at this. How are we going to do this? How are we going to remain confident? How are we going to know Him through life experiences? The next thing I thought about is this. And it hits every single one of us at some level. We cannot be wishy-washy. I don't even know if wishy-washy is a word, but I've heard it said before. We can't be wishy-washy. We can't be in the church one day and out of the church the next day. We can't love God one day and not love God the next day. Our relationship with Him has got to be built on more than just an emotional high. It's got to be built on more than just, just something that somebody else teaches us. But we've got to be wishy-washy. The Bible teaches us in several scriptures in Hebrews 13 and 4. He says these words. For we are made partakers of Christ. Watch this. If we hold the, the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Two things here that really comes to my mind. First of all, I think about what the word, as you look at this, partakers really mean. The word partaker actually means that, that we are a participant. In other words, if we participate, if we continue, if we remain, he teaches us there that we've got to be steadfast to the very end of the journey. The word confidence, again, if you look at this word confidence in, 
is uh, either Jesus is Lord of all or Jesus is not Lord at all. Hallelujah. We can't go through life serving God on the conditions uh, of whether everything's going our way or whether it's not going our way. Our God is sure. The foundation of God standeth sure this evening. And i gotta, I got to say this. And as I thought about this as I studied, a lot of times we think God's this this great big Santa Claus in the sky. And whatever we throw out, God's got to meet that demand. We, again, got to understand, God is not like Santa Claus. Amen? And we got to understand that God has promised in His Word that He would never leave us, He would never forsake us. And God's Word is constant. It's a consistency in our lives every day. And God Himself, Jesus, told His disciples, I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. So therefore, if you've ever met people, and it's almost as if they are Christians based upon the conditions of their environment at the time. They love God based upon the conditions of the environment at that time. If they're going through a good time, hey, woo, Jesus is Lord. Everything's lovely. But you just wait till something happens and it knocks them off of their feet. See, the thing that I believe, that I believe God is speaking to me about this evening in my life and our life here this evening is that we've got to remain steadfast in our relationship with God. Amen. Somebody say steadfast. Yeah. We've got to have the confidence in God to remain steadfast. So we can't be wishy-washy. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be wishy-washy. We can't be wishy-washy. We can't, we can't just be up one day and down the other. We see, again, how the Bible teaches us if you look at the word of the Lord, the next thing is we've got to know him through life experiences. We can't be wishy-washy. We've got to be, we've got to be steadfast. James 1 and 8 says a double-minded man is unstable in part of his ways. No, in all his ways. The next thing I thought about when I was thinking about this message and Kelly putting it together, you've got to have some roots. You've got to be planted. You gotta have to be planted in the Lord. Do you know that the, the I think it's called it's Chinese bamboo? Anybody ever heard of Chinese bamboo? But Chinese bamboo is like this, and, and you can buy it in these little stores all around town sometimes, little shops and stuff. For the first five years of that bamboo's life, it don't even grow hardly. You look at it and it don't even grow. I mean, it, it'll it'll remain just like that for five years. But do you know that during that five years, guess what's happening? It's developing its root system. Its roots are spreading out. Its roots are growing, growing deeper, and they're grabbing, and they're holding on. And then at the end of that five years, that thing can grow. Watch this. It can grow shoots up to 90 feet tall and just grow up because why? Because it's got a foundation. It's got roots. It's got roots. And the Bible teaches you and I, as you, you've got to be planted in the Lord. Way over in the book of Psalms, and I've got to turn there and read this one. Way over in the book of Psalms, it teaches us in Psalm chapter number one. A lot of you probably already know this particular psalm. But this is what it says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Verse 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Remember that word right there for just a few minutes. And in verse number 3 it says this, And he shall be like a tree, watch this next word, planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in due season. In other words, when you think about that Chinese bamboo, you don't see the fruit of that thing immediately. A lot of times we see folks get in church, and then the next thing you know, they're out of church. You see them and they're in church, and they're out of church. But what God is trying to get us to do is to get our root system in place uh, so that when fear comes, uh, so that when adversities come, uh, so that when troubles come, uh, so that when storms come, uh, oh, my friend, I might be but I won't break. I'll be able to take it. Amen. I'll be able to stand. Oh, hallelujah. And that is what God is trying to get the church of the 21st century to do. It don't make no never mind about the economy. It's going to 
relationship with God upon the emotion that they feel. We are emotional people. We are emotional people. I don't want to. I don't want to jump over that. But I don't base my the totality of my relationship with God upon what I'm feeling. So He teaches us in, in Psalms. He teaches us again, and and those people that are blessed of the Lord that walk not in the counsel of the ungodly or standeth with sinners or sinners in the seat of the scornful. He says in verse three. He says and, and he shall be like a tree. This next word he says planted. Are you with me tonight? Planted. Planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth his fruit in season, and his leaves uh, shall also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall what? Prosper. Whatever he doeth shall prosper. What this really, what this word is teaching us is this, is that we cannot let fear counteract your faith. You cannot let fear counteract your faith. Now watch this. And move you into unbelief. Again, my mind goes back to the scripture of the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years. Spent all her money. Spent everything she had. Went to the doctors. And everything she had done. But yet the Bible said she grew the worse. But yet Jesus came to town. And she said to herself, Oh, but if I can only but touch the heel of his garment, I know that I will be made well. And through that crowd, she pressed her way in. And Jesus said, Who touched me? Peter said, What do you mean, who touched you? I felt virtue. I know somebody touched me. I felt virtue go out of me. But see, this woman, watch this. This woman had to believe, watch this, in Jesus, she had to believe in her healing before she ever received her healing. Hello? So the Bible teaches us that we are to be planted. Anybody ever tried to dig a stump out of the ground? I know some of you men have. It's not an easy task. You can cut that thing off the ground. But guess what? You get your matic out and your shovel out. You look around and you think, my goodness, I thought I had this tree down. Oh, no. I know Jen with his brother, they dig up these roots and they, they dig up the stumps and all that. Sometimes these roots can go hundreds of feet down into the ground. Look at an oak tree, how tall it is. But yet that oak tree can only stand if it's got a foundation. You and I this evening as Christians, and I know that you know this, and I don't want to sound redundant. I don't want to just repeat everything I've already said before. But we've got to always check our foundation. You can put a suit on, you can put a smile on. Put your dress on, ladies, and come to church and be all pretty. But yet on the inside you can be falling apart. I believe today that God, I believe this law is with me. I believe that God is preparing his church for these end times. I believe the church is going to have to have something to stand on more than just coming to church on a Sunday morning and, and, and writing out a tithe check and, and putting your name on the roll. I believe we're going to have to have something to stand on that's going to be foundational in the days ahead. Amen. Let me move on quickly. The Bible again teaches us that we are to be unmovable. Acts 20 and 24 says, as the Jew and the Gentile, as they were having the conversation there, these, this word comes up and says, none of these things move me. In the word of God in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, where that Jesus is proclaiming victory in, in the previous verses of that, it says, thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But verse number 58 is the key here, because he teaches the, the brethren, he teaches the church, therefore, my beloved brethren, Watch this. Be ye steadfast. The next word is unmovable. How are you going to overcome fear? Fear of failure. Fear of lack. All kinds of fears that come to us in our lives. You're going to have your confidence in God. You're going to remain steadfast. Unmovable. Always. Abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. The 
next part of this message is something that we probably don't even think about. How am I going to overcome fear? How am I going to be able to confront this? The second part is the part that I thought about is we've got to develop spiritual disciplines. What I mean by that is we've got to pray for ourselves. We've got to spend time with God in prayer and in fasting. We see this in the word of how the, the Bible says that the chief Jesus was there with the, with, with the disciples and the disciples come back to Jesus and said, we couldn't cast these out. And Jesus said, these go up not out but by prayer and fasting. That's called spiritual disciplines. You discipline yourself to pray. You discipline yourself to spend time with God every day. And I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I stand before you guilty. Sometimes I get so busy. Sometimes our lives are just so chaotic. Just going and going. But I've learned to pray my way through the day. I've learned to, to pray as I go throughout my day. And, and, and think about the Lord. See, the Bible teaches us that prayer can put the enemy to flight. Don't raise your hand. Because I don't want to embarrass nobody. But how many of you in this room Pray constantly and consistently. And young people, I'm not talking about when you get ready to take a test. I heard something the other day that said, there'll always be prayer in school as long as there's tests in school. <laughs> I thought, well, that's the truth. Are y'all awake? But we develop spiritual disciplines. And prayer, James, James talks about prayer in the word of the Lord. We see this in James chapter number 4. And I love this scripture. I've got this scripture on my desk at home as a reminder to me where he says there in James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 and 9. He says this. He said, Submit yourself therefore to God. You overcome fear by faith, but yet the way up is down. As you humble yourself, as you surrender yourself, as you resign yourself to God. He says here in the word, he says, Submit yourself therefore to Unto God. A lot of times people will just pick up on this part. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But the part prior to that is submit yourself therefore unto God. Submit yourself to the Lord's authority. Submit yourself unto God first. He says in the word, submit yourself therefore unto God. Resist, which means to stand against. The word stand over in the book of Ephesians, when you've done all to stand, you know what that word means? It means to stand and keep on standing. Stand and keep on standing. So James reminds us again, he says, submit yourself therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he what? Will flee from you, you overcome fear, you overcome dread, you overcome loss, you overcome doubt, you overcome these things by submitting yourself to God. Then look at this in verse number 8. Draw nigh, draw near, draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. Several years ago, that just... That scripture just came alive in my heart. It came alive in my spirit. I mean, I've heard the scripture. I've read the scripture. We know the scripture. And this is what it is. Brother Steve, can I get you a minute? Just come here. I know this is very elementary. And it's very simplistic. If Brother Steve was God here this evening, I'll play myself. I don't want to play God this evening. But here's what this word means. When you draw nigh unto God, and God will draw nigh unto you. If you take a step towards God, God will take a step towards you. If you take a step towards God, and God will take a step towards you. And you and God will eventually hook up. Yeah. You've got to draw nigh unto God, thank you, Steve. Draw nigh unto God, and God will draw nigh unto you. Amen? The next thing is, he says, to cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your minds, your, your hearts, you double-minded. And then he says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. When I read over that scripture, I, I, I kind of had to work my way through that. Because there the Bible teaches us to be broken 
humble, to be contrite, to humble ourselves before the Lord, to weep and to mourn before God. I tell you what, something, my friends, sometimes you've got to weep your way to joy. As I preached that message about a year ago, right after I come here, sometimes you've got to weep your way through. Sometimes you've got to pray your way through. Sometimes it ain't going to come in a moment. Sometimes it ain't going to come in an instant. But my friend, if you'll be consistent, if you'll hold on to God, if you'll draw near to God, if you'll purify your hearts, if you'll cleanse your hands, if you'll purify your life, and as you do that, as you weep and you mourn and you humble yourself before God, I'm telling you, God will show up. When God shows up, He's going to show out. Amen? You're, going, you're not going to have to wonder whether He's there or not. And then He teaches us in verse number 10, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. That's what the Word says. James 5 and 13, again, moving right along. He says, If any of you be afflicted, let him pray. If any be merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he had committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. But what the emphasis here is this, that if you pray, God will Amen. The next thing is not only prayer and fasting. That little word in the book of Psalms that we read here this evening is Selah. Selah is a word that just simply means to pause and think about. Sometimes we got to bring our minds in the subjection to the Lord. We've got to meditate. You think now. Meditate. The word, the word, is, the word meditate. Sometimes we, we we think about it in a bad connotation, but it's not a bad word. The Bible teaches us to be still and know that I am God. Sometimes we talk too much. Remember something that John Hagee said years ago. He said, "I'll go talk to God." You can tell I used to listen to him. I'll go talk to God. He said, I'll pour out myself to God in prayer. He said, generally, it's just a complaint. But I'll pour out myself to God in prayer. He said, I take a legal pad, and I sit there, and I, I, I wait till God speaks to me. In other words, he's meditating. Sometimes we need to turn the TV off. We need to turn the radio off. We need to turn the cell phones off. And I'm preaching to myself here in the singing, and we just need to meditate on God. We need to think of God without all the distractions of the day. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We live in a busy society. We live in a busy day. You've got to make time to do this if you're going to have your life filled with faith instead of fear and, and dread and sorrow and all the other things that I can name to see. But he teaches us in the Word that we are to meditate. Again, the word, the word talks about this, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto thee, O Lord my God. In the Psalm 107, verse number 30, uh, 34, watch this. He says that, that my meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. My meditation of him shall be sweet. Sweet. I know that we know these scriptures. I know that there's, there's, they're not new scriptures to you. But I believe today as we think upon the things of God. Because the devil wants you to sit around in your office, in your car, on your job. And worry, 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 And he's got his own bony finger out there pointing at you all the time. Hello. <laughs> it's a truth, thing. But we just need to put our minds, let our minds be stayed upon him. We need to let our minds meditate upon the goodness of God. And when I think about what the Lord's done for me and how he set me free and all those other songs we could sing and talk about this evening. Before long, my friend, if you just stop and meditate upon God, your worries are going to subside. Your worries are going to diminish. Because all the raiment that you were worried about, 
said Solomon in all of these things were not arrayed like the birds. Consider the lilies of the field. They toil not, neither do they spin. But, but God takes care of the lilies. I look at these little, you ladies will have to help me here, these little yellow flowers that come out sometimes in the middle of the winter, but right in the early spring, what are they? The little, the little lily things. What are they? Yeah, those daffodil things. I guess that's what it is. You know, I told you already, I love spring. I love, I love spring of the year when everything's coming to life. But I look at these little yellow flowers that come out in the spring of the year, and it just, every year, it just amazes me. Year after year, those things are like dormant through the winter. Through the cold, even in the mountains where it's 10 below zero. And just as soon as the sun comes up in the spring, guess what? These little bulbs that lay there all winter froze in the earth still have life in them. Your life, my life, still has life in it. All it takes is a good move of the S-O-N. It takes a move of the Holy Ghost. And that that you thought was dead in your life, that that you thought was history in your life, that that you thought was gone. The devil will tell you that you'll never sing again, that you'll never preach again, You'll never do, that you'll never do what I've called you to do again. And y'all are just going to have to forgive me here. Shut up, devil. You need to just tell the devil, shut up. I'm a child of God and I'm tired of listening to you. I know the Bible says neither give place to the devil. But sometimes you've just got to stand in who you know you are in Christ and say, shut up, devil. I know we teach our children not to say shut up, but I'm sorry. You just need to tell the devil to shut up. You're talking to the wrong, talk to the hand. You know some of you hear the kids do that? Talk to the hand. Because the hand don't have ears. I'm not listening. It's one of the stuff that the kids would do at youth camp, you know? I know our kids don't do that so much. But look what the word of the Lord says. And I'm going to wrap this up here. In the word of the Lord of Philippians, you, I know that you know this scripture, but Philippians chapter number 4, look at in verse number 4. Rejoice in the Lord every now and then. children, your 
as a pastor, when you've got 300 people, and every, every one of them think different and, and act different and process different? Do you know that I would drive myself insane if I tried to please 300 people? I wouldn't even sleep at night, bud. <laughs> There's no way. I wouldn't need either, would I? That's why we have to obey God. That's why we have to do what the Bible says. That's why pastor has to preach the word. And just shoot it out there as it is. You know, because it's God, God's word. We can't worry. We can't fret. Can I, can I give somebody a news flash? You will never, ever, ever, ever be able to please all of people. You'll never be able to. Do your best. Do your job. If you go to your job, you do an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. A man that won't work is not worthy to eat according to Scripture. But give it your all. Give it your best. And in your best, understand. And you know what? Let me let me meddle here for a minute. Years ago, when the Lord was, I was at this place in my life, and, and God was whittling away at me all the time. Just, you know, and, I, I gotta be real honest. Can I be real, real transparent and real honest? Thank you. Do we ever said that? I remember watching TV, and, and, and I would pick up on mannerisms from this pastor on TV or this preacher on TV. The Rod Carson thing, when Rod Carson was real popular several years ago, then I'd, I'd listen to T.D. James, and I'd, and I'd, I'd listen to some Church of God preachers, and I was, I was getting a little bit of a nugget of, of mannerisms from each and every one of them. I didn't know who I was. <laughs> I didn't know whether to get ready or, or something else. I didn't know what was going on, you know? But T.D. Jake said something one day that just, just, just somehow I came out of a warp zone just, just like this, just that quick and lined up. And David was a small little feller that took some stones and killed the giant. And he said, when God needs a David, he'll raise up a David for the job that he's called the David's David. He was using that as an analogy. And he said, you cannot be like anybody else. You've got to be who God made you be. Amen. And he said, when God needs a T.D. Jakes, I can't do his voice. He said, when God needs a T.D. Jakes, stuck his chest out. He said, I'm the best T.D. Jakes that there is. And I thought, wow. When, when God needs Alan Green, I'm the best Alan Green there is. When God needs a Bobby Sparks, he's, he's the best Bobby Sparks there is and so on and etc. Why? Because you've got to be able to be what God's called you to be and, 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 and drop all the fear off, if you will, and, and line up with God's word and, and just be who God's called you to be without the expectation of people always hanging all over you. When he said that that day, I thought, I can just be me. I can, I can just preach the way God put in me to preach. I used to be me. You talk about liberating. Then I wanted to shout. <laughs> get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs> but, but I mean, I, you know, I, it was liberating. And I thought, I don't have to be like somebody else for God to use me. And all of that, all that just this anxiety of, of trying to learn how to preach and all that anxiety of trying to be the best pastor in town, so to speak. And, and I, all of, I mean, I just settled in to, to who God made me to be. And I thought, you know, it's pretty cool. You can just be yourself and please God. You don't have to walk under the spotlight of the TV evangelist or anything. Just be yourself. Amen. And all that anxiety and all that tension and all that pressure just kind of subside. Are you comfortable being you? The secret? That was not in my outline, no way. And Alex has got it up there. She, she can take it. It's not on the paper. Just be who God made you to be. Now, I do believe that you can learn and glean and pick up nuggets along 
of the journey, and you can apply them to your life. You're going to see a man by the help of the Lord if, if, time, if time goes by. You're going to see a man by the help of the Lord standing in this pulpit on May the 27th, Pastor Ron Dawson. That man poured and poured and poured into my life. And I wasn't trying to mimic the man, but it was just so much of him he poured into me. And even, even years ago, I'd say, let's dig a lot. Let's dig a little bit. Let's dig in here and see what God I just picked it up with Brother Dawson. Now, I guarantee you, when he comes, he'll, he'll say it. But it's just something that I picked up on. Was that me trying to mimic him? Because it become a natural part of who I am. Amen? Everybody needs a good leader. Everybody needs somebody that they can mentor. That they can look to. That's what I did with Pastor Dawson. He's a fantastic the last thing I'm going to leave with you tonight is this. Love. Love God with every fiber within you. Because he teaches us in the word in 1 John 4, 18 and 19, and, and I'm not going to turn there and read every bit of it, but it says here in the word that perfect love casts First, First John 14 and 18 again says this, there is no fear in love. The perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath for men. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. My question today is in overcoming fear, You've got to let love be the ruling factor in your life. Because perfect love gets out fear. Do you love him tonight? Yeah. My prayer is this evening that through this day, even through the morning, 